Hello again. If you're wondering what that intro has to do with this next video, some time ago a viewer had asked me about measuring the speed of light. You can see my dog is not as fast as my laser pointer, so probably a dog would not be the way to make that measurement. If you've taken any high school or college physics classes, you're probably aware of the history behind measuring the speed of light. When I was quite a bit younger, I bought this book. It's called The Laser Cookbook, 88 Practical Projects. It's written by Gordon McComb. It's a pretty decent book. If you're a hobbyist and just wanting to play with lasers, you can see it's got introduction to lasers, working with lasers, basic skills, laser safety, introduction to optics, experimenting with light and optics. You can see the book is quite thick. It's 404 pages. And the book is just loaded with experiments that you could perform with a basic laser. So back when, when I was playing around with that book, a friend of mine had given me this laser this actually come out of one of the earlier laser discs. It's a helium neon type. See back here is the transformer, high voltage power supply, tube resides right here. Originally this had a beam splitter and a detector in it and that's all been removed. If I turn this on, let's just see. The beam probably looks dispersed but that's probably a function of the camera. So one of the early experiments I did was I made this little contraption here. So the way this works is I've basically got my iPod connected up to a small AM modulator circuit. It's located down here. So we're basically AM modulating this beam. The only thing on this circuit is an LED that I'm using for a detector. I have an AMD modulator and an audio amplifier. So this is looking at the schematic for that circuitry. On the front end, I'm just using an LED. I'm probably not using a 741 op amp. I probably have something else in there, but I do have a LM386 audio amplifier. And I'm only running off of a single 9 volt battery, but other than that, uh, the circuitry is basically the same. So let's go ahead and we'll turn on our iPod. Just a magnifying lens. I remember when I first built this circuit, I hooked a radio up to the laser, and then my wife and I took this and went out for a walk. And I think we got about a mile away before I could no longer detect the audio off of the laser. I remember being pretty impressed on how far I could transmit audio just using an AM modulated light. One way we could detect the speed of light is we could pulse that laser. We could send the pulse down to a mirror, bounce that back to our little sensor here, and we could measure that propagation delay. The problem with something like this is this sensor is very slow. The reason we'd want to use a mirror versus just putting the sensor out here directly in the beam is the mirror would basically double our distance. And of course as I double the distance or double the amount of time, there's a better chance that I can measure that with the equipment that we have. So when we talk about light, normally what we're talking about is what's visible by the human eye. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, just like radio waves, gamma rays, UV, X-rays. Those are all forms of electromagnetic radiation. Of course, that doesn't mean that radio waves are light. So I picked up a bag of red lasers. I think this cost me somewhere around $10. And then you can see I have one currently attached to a piece of coax. This is currently attached to my function generator and I'm outputting a pulse. And then I'm just gonna point this at our little decoder board. There you go, you can see our laser is flashing once a second hear the speaker clicking. So the output of our decoder is going to channel 2 which is the pink trace and then the drive signal for the laser is the top trace in yellow. This thing's pretty touchy. You can see if I just hardly even touch that LED I'll knock it out of alignment. So currently the scope is set for 5 milliseconds per division. Let's go ahead and turn that up a little bit. 
and you can see our problem already is even at 100 microseconds per division our little LED sensor isn't going to be fast enough to decode this. So the pulse coming out of our decoder board is actually straight across our LED. This isn't going through the audio amp or anything. And that's the reason it slews as fast as it does. So what we need is a really fast sensor to be able to detect this. So when we're talking about the speed of light, we're typically talking about it in a perfect vacuum. Of course, if the light's going through anything other than a perfect vacuum, its speed is going to change, and that's based on something called the index of refraction. This is very similar to sending a pulse down a piece of cable, for example. In this case, we'd have something called a velocity factor for the coax cable. So if we were to take a pulse generator and send that onto a piece of coax of some known length, Essentially what's going to happen is that pulse is going to reach the end of this and then depending on how the end of this is terminated It's either going to be absorbed in our load So for example if I have a 50 ohm load resistor out here in a 50 ohm source All that energy is going to be dissipated in our load resistor out here If for example, it's an open what's going to happen is the pulse is going to reflect back and it's going to be in phase with our pulse so for example the pulse could look something like this. If the end of the wire was shorted, the pulse will reflect back and it's going to be out of phase. So the pulse will actually go negative. All right, so I've got my function generator attached again to the T of the scope. And you can see the scope triggering again once a second. Let's just go ahead and attach our cable. And basically, you don't see any change and the reason is is because this edge is so slow you can see we're talking 10 microseconds per division here we're at 2 this is 500 nanoseconds here's at 20 nanoseconds here's at 50 nanoseconds per division and you can just start to see a little bit of rise so the problem with taking a measurement like this is we need a very fast edge rate so to make this measurement, we're going to be using this LaCroix 7200. The scope's quite old. I've owned it for about 19 years. It was originally sold to the United States Air Force. One of the nice features with this scope is it has a 4 gigahertz plug-in. And this particular plug-in can output a pulse. And that's done off the menu here. So we just select pulse on or off. And then we can select the pulse width. So let's just set this for one microsecond for now and let's take our piece of coax and we'll attach this to the output of the scope so if we look at the waveform you can see this little bit of air again this is because the cable is not terminated let's go ahead and we'll attach a short and I'll zoom out a little bit let's just disconnect it again and so here's with an open and again this is with a short Let's go ahead and attach our 50 ohm load. So let me go ahead and we'll attach the output of the cable now to our other input. So T3 here is looking at the rise time of our pulse. It's roughly 150 picoseconds. The fall time we won't see because I'm not zoomed out far enough. This is looking at the mean voltage, standard deviation, peak to peak. This delay on T4 is the delay of this edge to a rising edge here. So you can see it's measuring roughly 17.5 nanoseconds. So if we select the cursors, you can see the same thing. It's roughly 17.45 nanoseconds. So again, this is roughly the length of time that it takes for the pulse here to travel down that length of coax and get to our input connector. So again, that time is going to be based on the speed of light multiplied by this velocity factor for this particular type of coax. Typically, coax will have a velocity factor somewhere between 0.66 and 0.8 or so. So here I have three different pieces of coax. These are all cut to the same length. These have a velocity factor of 0.78. Let me just go ahead and we'll connect one of these up. 
You can see our time is a little bit longer. It's roughly 18.2 nanoseconds. What we can do is go ahead and add another section. See now it's roughly 34.3 nanoseconds. Let's go ahead and we'll add our third piece. And you can see now we're at 50.4 nanoseconds. So again, fairly linear. So again, all these pieces of coax are roughly the same length. So you're going to expect the delay to increase by the same amount as we continue to add pieces of coax. So again, this is looking at the three pieces of coax that we just tested. Each one of these sections is 147 inches. And again, they have a velocity factor of 0.78. And again, the velocity factor is nothing more than the speed of light multiplied by whatever this velocity factor is. So it's a percentage of the speed of light in a vacuum. So there's a direct link between the speed of light and how fast that pulse will travel down this cable. Again, we had 18.2 nanoseconds for our first pulse width with one section of cable and then we had 34.3 nanoseconds and then with the third piece added we had 50.4 nanoseconds so if we look at the delta this is 16.1 nanoseconds so the difference between these two and the difference between these two is also 16.1 nanoseconds and the difference between this 16.1 and this 18.2 is going to be the scope itself. So the problem with that pulser coming off the oscilloscope is while the edge rate is very fast, again that slewing in roughly, I think we said 150 picoseconds. So fairly fast. Really though what we want is a pulse. So the way we're going to do that is with this homemade pulse generator. This is nothing more than a couple of caps, resistors, a high voltage power supply and a transistor so fairly easy to build obviously I made this one you could probably make one of these with just junk you have laying around in your drawer it's nothing really special about the transistor I used I think I used a 3904 maybe a 2N222 it's nothing special just a jelly bean transistor so let me go ahead and we'll hook this up to our oscilloscope as you can see the scope is currently set for one nanosecond per division it's sampling at five giga samples per second and it's reading a pulse width of roughly 1.8 nanoseconds. Okay, so again, one way to test this would be just to send the pulse on one end of this coax, shoot it down at the other end, and just measure that time difference. And whatever that is, we could determine the speed of light based on how long it took to propagate down the cable. But the problem with doing something like this is we have a few things that come into play first problem is the scope's going to have some error in the trigger circuitry so what I'd like to do is get rid of that so the way we're going to do that is we're going to use four sections of coax so we'll have some length here and a length here and we'll have a third length which is going to be a loop it looks something like this so out here this is our signal generator and again this is a 50 ohm source impedance and out here we have our scope which has a 50 ohm source impedance. So I put out this pulse, it starts working its way down the cable and it gets to this splitter. So part of the pulse is gonna propagate down this direction of the cable. Another part is gonna go down this length of the cable and the rest of it is gonna go down this length of the cable. So while this is traveling down this direction, these are going to continue around the loop until they intersect at this point. Half of that energy is going to go back this way towards the scope and see the 50 ohm terminator while the other is going to go this way towards the scope. So what we'll see coming out of here is a pulse followed by a pulse. The scope will trigger on this will capture this second wave. It really doesn't matter where the trigger jitter is because we're only triggering on this first pulse. And this time between this and this pulse is strictly the function of the length of this cable. All right, so here's our pulse generator. And this goes through a series of attenuators. Here's our splitter. 
this leg just goes up to our oscilloscope and this T goes off to our three legs of coax. You can see this just goes off to the single channel of the scope. You can see we're currently set at 10 nanoseconds per division and 200 millivolts per division. So again, signal is going to come out of our signal generator. It's going to go through the attenuator. It's going to come to this T. Part of the signal is going to go this direction towards the scope. The other part is going to go to our three segments of coax. Eventually they'll work their way all through this coax and they'll arrive back at the T where they'll recombine and part of the signal will go into the T this direction. The other part will head back towards the scope. And again that delay is what's causing this second pulse here. So let's go ahead and I'll just remove one segment of this. So now you can see just with a single section now the reason we'd want to run multiple sections is the same reason that we'd want to use a mirror and that's because the more time it takes the pulse to travel the more accurately that we can measure it with this oscilloscope. So I've plugged all this into a spreadsheet. These are some common velocity factors for some various coax. The stuff again that I'm using has a velocity factor of 0.78 by the manufacturer. You can see that gives us a propagation delay of 1.3 nanoseconds per foot. And again, I measure the length of each section of this coax. These are 147 inches. That's what this number is here. So our total cable length, which includes our connectors, because these are going to make a difference, I measure roughly 447 inches. So the time of flight is going to be roughly 48.55 nanoseconds. So again, looking at the oscilloscope, we're measuring between the peak of this pulse and the peak of this pulse. And the time between those are the period. Scope is measuring roughly 48.5 nanoseconds. And that's this number here, 48.5 nanoseconds. And again, that's compared to the ideal 48.55 nanoseconds. You can see that gives us a calculated speed of light is 9843232.2 versus the speed of light in a vacuum is 9835710087.9 that gives us a calculated error of 0.07647% so fairly close with this measurement again if we shortened up the cabling did it with like a single piece of cable that would increase the air I'm sure another thing we could do is use another oscilloscope again this oscilloscope has a bandwidth of 600 megahertz and it can sample at 10 giga samples I'm currently running it at 5 giga samples uh, you can run it on a two channel system though to get that 10 giga samples the other way to take the measurement would be to use this old scope again this is a wave master it's got a bandwidth of 5 gigahertz and it'll sample at 20 giga samples. What I'd like to do next is repeat this experiment using the laser. Again, the problem is the detector that I have, which is just an LED, we've already shown that this is way too slow. So we need a faster detector. And it just so happens I have some different ones here. These are made by Hamamatsu. This is uh, another one made by Perkin Elmer. So these detectors have a much faster response than what our LED does. We could easily measure the pulses that we're trying to generate. The problem that we have is, again, if I've got a laser and I'm shining that light out at a mirror, the room is only so long. So what I'd like to do is actually fire this thing down a chunk of fiber optic cable and then have a receiver on the other side and again the receiver is going to be one of these PMTs but the problem with the fiber optic cable is there's only certain wavelengths that this stuff will let through beyond that it gets very inefficient I had originally hoped to use this PMT this is pretty fast so I ended up buying some different lasers 
these have different wavelengths you can see this one is 405 nanometers uh, this one is closer to the green spectrum and my hope was when I would pass this light which is way off of where the fiber optic cable wants to work at that the detectors would be sensitive enough to pick that up unfortunately it turned out not to be the case what ended up working the best was just using a red laser and overdriving it and using this tube here show you what it looks like so we're going to have the laser beam focusing a light into a beam splitter and again what's going to happen is some of the light is going to bounce this direction part of it's going to run through out here I'm going to have my PMT and then the light that comes off of this is going to go through our fiber optic cable and then what I'll either do is feed it back into our lens this way so again part of the light will come this direction or it's going to go straight or what I'll do if this is too much attenuation I'll just take the fiber optic cable and we'll point that directly at the PMT this is looking at the PMT along with the power supply this power supply just runs off of basically 12 volts and generates the high voltages for the tube again the R955 is usable between 160 nanometers and 900 nanometers well within the range of these cheap red lasers so what we need is a fixture of course for this we're not going to be using a high grade optical table so what I have here is just some plywood and I'm going to stick the PMT down inside of here and you can see I have my beam splitter stuck in the center so we'll be taking our laser and we'll be mounting that into the side hole here Again, that will be pointing at the splitter and there's a slit down in the fabric and the PMT will be located right there all right so here's our test setup again our waveform generator is here this is the pot to adjust the sensitivity of our PMT which is just sitting in the side of our box here again this fiber optic cable when I purchased this you can see they show a length of 10 meters I went ahead and measured this it actually came up to 33.167 feet this cable has a index of refraction of 1.484 that should give us a time of flight of 50.042 nanoseconds and it is currently running you can see the red laser there again you won't see it on the back side because it's going against the PMT so the light hits that splitter exits out here through our fiber optic cable and that comes through the hole in the box here and goes straight into the PMT as well so there's essentially one path that's going straight through the splitter into the tube and the other one coming off the splitter around the fiber cable into the tube as well now these pulses are actually inverted so I have them inverted in the scope you can see I and V and again we are at 10 nanoseconds per division right now and if we look at our period you can see it's roughly 50.6 or so nanoseconds 50.7 let me just wiggle our fiber optic can see well, if I pull that out that second pulse will go away Again, I'm just moving it right here and you can see if I plug it back in waveform will show back up likewise I can take the tube here and rotate it you can see and change the sensitivity and again this pot changes our sensitivity of the tube so again it looks fairly close to what we would predict so I think that's going to be it for this video 
I'd say these couple of experiments were a success. Again, there's nothing really challenging about this experiment. Uh, fairly easy again to set this up. The fiber cable was fairly cheap. Lasers were cheap. The only thing that was really an expense here would definitely be the PMT. You could probably buy something like this used up on eBay if you want to run an experiment like this. Again, using the fiber optic cable versus trying to bounce this light off of a mirror, this is definitely a better way to go if you were trying to do this measurement. Well, that's going to be it for now. Until the next video. Later.